and we're live. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Welcome and everybody back to Behind the Mimbar, Blueprints for a Better Masjid, where insha'Allah we level up uh, one episode at a time. And somehow, some way, I got Rami Qawas in the chair. <laughs> Welcome, Rami. Well, well, pleasure, my pleasure. Rami is my guy. We share a stomping ground uh, back in the uh, Mass Youth Center. Uh, we came to the masjid scene uh, as consumers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we drank the Kool-Aid together, and we can't stop thanking Allah Azza wa Jal for that Amen. beautiful brotherhood. Uh, and Rami uh, has since, mashallah, really uh, carved the place for himself where I struggle to just call him Rami anymore. <laughs> Big bro Rami, mashallah, has uh, trekked a path in, in uh, leadership, development, human resource management, uh, even stretched himself, and may Allah reward him and his family to... Uh, uh, really bona fide these things through his studies at Harvard, and now you serve at Oak Tree. And so, so tell us a little bit about that, how you got yeah, here, what you're Jeremy. doing, and what Oak Tree is about. Sure. Because sure. they need to know. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, uh, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salam rasulullah. So, first and foremost, uh, love the initiative. May Allah reward you, Muhammad. And it's, uh, this is, um, I think it's these little new uh, venues of how we can change an ummah, change a community. I think taking all the means um, that we can. So I love the, uh, fell in love with the initiative when I first saw it launch. So may Allah reward you. Uh, you know, um, everybody involved. Yeah, I, I think, you know, yeah, two Brooklyn kids, right? That um, kind of grew up finding a passion for the deen, um, figuring out how to serve Allah Azza wa Jal through the various opportunities. I think we're very blessed. Um, opportunities we're giving to serve the deen in a, in a very unique way. Um, I think that began, yeah, when we were really curious, start studying and diving into understanding your faith in a in a different way, uh, going to the masjid, uh, hop, masjid hopping, seminars, uh, halakat, mentors, right? You, you just start to immerse yourself as much as you can, particularly college years and then post-college years in, in like in enriching yourself and understanding your deen, your identity, your faith. Uh, connecting to Allah Azza wa Jal. And then naturally where that comes is like, hey, I, I, I absorb all this and I have to re reciprocate it some, some way. And I want to give back and I want to you know, influence and change and bring progress. Uh, I think that was, yeah, that was kind of through college and then post-college. Um, just found that passion. Matthew Center, as you mentioned, like uh, found a very, very passion in giving back. I think the first time I ever volunteered was summer camp i was 16 years old Allah, watching yeah. young kids in the center like you know taking care of them and i was like hey this is this is fun this is exciting good friends that we know uh Tahir and others like you know just like hey you connect with with kids you see as yourself and it's like hey i this is my this is my children this is my these are my brothers and how do i you know continue to serve them i think from there just really quickly i think i you know very quickly, when you're a young, ambitious person in the masjid, they're going to drag you or in the center. They're going to drag you into every, every nook and cranny, right? You're going to be on a board. You're going to be a volunteer. You're going to be at this committee, that committee, do this, do that, do jama'ah, talk here, right? So naturally, you get grabbed into all the things. And I think when you're young and zealous and you're trying to learn, you're trying to teach, um, you, you dive into everything. So I think I've, I ran the gamut of like being a volunteer, uh, working part-time for a center, um, hopping to different places, particularly across the city, um, then being on boards and seeing some of the functionality and dysfunctionality, um, then be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to start working with some national organizations at a national level. I'm going to start to connect with different leaders, different institutes. And all of a sudden, subhanAllah, like, you know, your journey in Muslim community leadership is very broad, very vast. And I think there's a lot of experiences, a lot of challenges, uh, being full-time for a long time. Um, I think you understand the nitty-gritty, the hard, the, the, the tough days, and the, the days where, you know, you really see somebody's life change or somebody accepts the faith or, you know, you really see a young person evolve in front of your eyes and flourish. Like, there's moments, subhanAllah, that are very, you know, Allah kind of rewards us with that gratification of seeing Keep the fruits going. of your labor. A yeah, little bit of this. You, yep, you, yep. We need that constant... Um, Energy, because community work, honestly, it's the most difficult work, in my opinion. I, I mean, I think there's generally like there's a uh, like a macro level. You have like you have your for-profit sector, 
where people, you know, you go to work, you work business, whatever it is, and people go into that sector. Then you have your government sector. And obviously, government uh, usually takes in a lot of things that we're not used to. So, you know, your lights, your this, your that, your streets, your schools, right? The government sector takes care of that. And at least in a capitalist society, then the, not, the for-profit sector covers a lot of what government isn't because somebody's going to try to make money over things that nobody else is doing. Private ventures, unique. Right, yeah. right. And then really where nonprofit fits is all the, all the rest. Right. What the government really doesn't want to do <laughs> and what nobody's making money from doing, hence the, the term nonprofit. By definition. By definition. Not profitable. Yeah. So at a very macro level, if you think about it, where do we fit? Like, oh yeah, who's going to teach my kid Quran? Who's going to lead uh, Friday services? Who's going to do a, a Sunday school? Yeah, that's going to be a... No, no government institution, you know, hopefully, is going to come and, yeah. you know, do it. To, I mean, I mean, of course, we're talking about exactly. over, overrun by the government, the overreach of government. Yeah. Right. And then, sure, there's a there's a, a, a more of a for profit, particularly nowadays, like, hey, how do we how can I the capitalist Muslim ventures? How can because I monetize I can, this? Yeah. I, huh. Yeah. I want to be able to control everything here and I want to do this and serve the Muslim community. That's grown a lot, too. Yeah, but still, the the community heavily relies on for sure where messages fit. So there's centers fit. so there's something you mentioned here that I do want to uh, double click on, which is the fact that you had your personal passion of serving this dean and your uh, professional life dovetail before a lot of your uh, higher level training, mm. meaning you were involved serving, directing, leading mm. uh, before you got to Harvard, before sort of you're collecting sure. some of the data you're collecting in the very recent past. And so what, because you know, those, we are impatient creatures, as you just said, we sure. need a little bit of like, keep going, here's a fruit. Yeah, That actually can have a opposite reaction of getting us complacent, like, hey, things are going fine. We have a few, we've had a few shahadas. Yeah, who hasn't had a few shahadas, sure. right? Sure. And so what made you feel this sense of need that, no, we need to now uh, refine Elevate. our skill sets further? Yeah. Because you're already a professional, per se, yeah. in your passion that's already locked in. What made you go back to learn? What made you sort of be involved in something more systematic, infrastructurally yeah. speaking, uh, to do better? Where would it that. come from that, you know, the episode is uh, revolving around, whether we agree or disagree on the name, uh, Masjid Mayhem, right? Yeah. I'm sure there's something there sure. uh, that you can benefit us with sharing. Yeah, great question. Great question. And I think, uh, I, I hope, inshallah, may Allah accept, I think I've been trying to be very intentional of everything I've been trying to do. Um, very early on, obviously, once you get immersed in community work and you are like a, a CEO, of, like you're doing everything. every Everything from picking up garbage, serving food, to like I'm giving Juma to like, hey, I'm doing a strategic plan for this team. Like you're, you're involved in everything. And I think uh, having great mentors, having great people around you is really important. You have to have like a good infrastructure of really good um, – you know, people that are able to teach you, mentor you, um, coach you, t uh, you know, very much direct you. And I think I, I really had that in mass circles. Like, it, like you got a sense of like, wow, this is a, there's there's a, a nuance to organizational growth. I think where that took me naturally, and this was after a long time of exploring, is first from personal experiences. I saw there was one, the ultimate correlator of success of a committee, a camp, uh, a center, uh, a region, a masjid, anything, to me the ultimate correlator was, look, it's the people in that institution and particularly it's the leaders in that institution. And I, I, I used to immerse myself obviously in a lot of religious leadership stories from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and afterwards, but also like John Maxwell books and Franklin Covey books. And really I, I saw like, hey, if you have good leadership, you have success in whatever that endeavor is. So leadership to me was like the number one correlator. So, hey, tell me about a good community, I guarantee you they have good leadership. Tell me about a great masjid, I guarantee you it's not. And when leadership is, you know, I, I love the saying of the Prophet, right? Uh, the, that it, to translate it really quickly, is like, hey, people are like camels, and it's really difficult to find the one that treads the entire path of the desert. But that rahila, the one that's able to carry you across, that's the gem, in the, the diamond in the rough, if you will. Mm. 
I think that's what leadership is to me. Like, so hey, finding and forging these types yeah, of people, producing them. Was yeah, and it's not about the it's not about the quantity. It's about the quality, right? right? It's not about having a lot of people. You know, it's not like it's about having a few really good leaders that are able to tread the path forward for a. Let's just talk right now, like at organizational level, like they're able to build a good culture, create a good plan, mobilize people together. People feel energized. There's a direction. Like those are all leadership things. Yeah. So I think I was like, oh, I want to immerse myself in that. I want to be able to first know how to change people. So I, I think behavioral change became like really important to me, the psychology of like mm. human development behavior. But then uh, interestingly, there's a lot of correlations to how organizations change. And I love that that piece. And so the, hence the org psychology kind of came into like, hey, I really love this. I, really, I love the concepts of how do we get people to make these transformations? How do we get institutions to make the transformations? So, so I think managing that, that, people the right way yes. to get them. So yes. where do you see, uh, forget the shortfalls, sure. how do you see the ideals uh, that by contrast, we will be, we, we will be able to introspect, be self-critical and yeah. say, do we have this or not? What are the best uh, for practices, leaders, for leaders. values yeah. uh, to manage the leaders you hire? Or if you're not at that stage yet, sure. you are that leader de facto. Sure. Let's talk about how to become a leader. Let's okay. talk about like, okay, so what does it mean? And I, here I, I preface this because I'm, I'm a student of the space. I'm not an expert in any way. But I think there's... Look, leadership, there's a there's a very corporate culture to leadership. Because obviously in organizations and, you, you know. You took it out your, of my mouth. That was my yeah, next question. There's, there's a huge corporate yeah. culture. Because, cause look, naturally, remember, if you can make money off of something in this country, like, people are going to do it. So you naturally have, like, your manager trainings and, you know, like, you, you know, like your leadership development in the corporate space, which is really good and important, a lot to learn from there. And I'm, I, I'm in that space. Like, I understand that space. Then you have like governmental leadership, which is a different ballgame altogether too. Like, okay, how do I speak to the masses and how do I pitch and how, you know, PR. So it's, that's, a, that's a different ballgame to get all, all together too. That's why I, I talk about the, the macro. I think community leadership or nonprofit leadership is very unique. And I think some gurus actually say, look, your best leaders are a nonprofit because the sacrifice is the highest without the the benefits the material immediate yeah the material yeah the so in a government i'm going to get some kind of power or in a court for profit i'm going to get some kind of there's some kind of money there's like an incentive that's there in the for the most part which yeah. is fine again too uh with ethical considerations but the community sector the, the like i'm gonna i want to be a leader in a masjid or i want to i want to have um i want to have influence in in the in the muslim community no, that's a that's a different. There's a different standard, and like that's a a path we have to tread and create. Like, what is the standard there? How do we develop leaders there? So that's been my that's it's a completely a, different a, sort a completely of different. value system that needs to drive it. Hundred percent, particularly with with the Muslim Islamic values, right. right? Like what we understand in terms of the simple things, sincerity. like yeah, sincerity, Serv servant uh, leadership, yeah, fame. Is it good or bad? Right. Um, influence. What does that mean? Um, uh, how do I, how do I, what is power in the Muslim, what is the power in the community? What, how does, how does authority work? Where does it come from? There are many nuanced conversations that nobody's having, right? And we have, and naturally you have this, I think, uh, take a step back, like our community is really young. Like you, our parents came and they were just laying the groundwork of the institutions. The messages are, you know, we, they started a few hundred, now there are a few thousand in our lifetime, probably tens of thousands in our children's lifetime, maybe hundreds of thousands, right? So the, the growth is going to happen. But then it's not just the, it's not the infrastructure that's the problem. It's the people capacity that, that we're going to worry about. Right. Like, how do we make sure, I think most messages care about people just coming to the masjid. I care about what leadership will be in the masjid? Because that'll actually dictate if people come or not. Right. Do we have the right leadership? Do we have the right influence of from from religious leadership to executive operational leadership? Like, is that ready to meet the needs that will our community? Yeah, will and I always be? tell people, and I shared this with a previous guest, that I, I try to shake people out of measuring uh, their success as a community by Jummah. Like, hey, listen, Jummah is mandatory, even sure. if you can't stand your guts, sure. Mr. Yeah. Man on the altar, yep. right? That's 100%. not symmetric. And so how do you actually get people here? Yep. Uh, 
yep. let's be honest. Outside of Juma and Ramadan is how I will measure your impact as a community. Because so those how are do you become those are gonna leader? be those are gonna be the ones where people, yeah, the, the, by default, Allah is gonna just wired in our DNA as believers, the DNA of a believer, like you're gonna come uh, those are places that the that the house of Allah are gonna be filled. It's yeah. every it's all the other times that you really like that's a, maybe a metric, if you will, of like, okay, how successful is your community? Um, so leadership itself, how to build out that leader. The value system is important. Yeah. What else can we share about the differences? Because I've seen, of course, the unprofessional mayhem is one thing. Yeah. The, the other side of it is maybe not noticing the difference, the necessary difference sure. between sort of corporate leadership yep. and between nonprofit servant yes. leadership. Yes. So how else do we uh, mitigate this? Appreciate you bringing, bringing us back. So go back to what I was saying. What is What makes a successful community leader? I think it's really... Three critical things. And a lot of things stem from them, for sure. Um, I think first and foremost, you have to have a strong ability to connect to people. Uh, leadership is all about people. Uh, people change people. I really believe that. Relationship and So your ability to connect to people. You want to you wanna call, talk about it in, in, yeah, how to influence, how to manage, how to delegate, how to communicate, uh, how to be emotionally intelligent. Like everything that you can imagine in leadership would fall under connections, but you've got to be able to connect to people well. Right, like there, there has to be. Leadership is about driving people forward. It's about influencing people. So if you can't click with people, then then you can be a leader of a different type, but not what the commu that communal leader that we're aspiring to. Right, right. right. So I think you know, I, I without um, interrupting your list, yeah, it's important. Maybe even just to reset people. Uh, <laughs> I that was actually one of my biggest regrets. Uh, I mean, we're gonna have many more of them. But I realized the management uh, struggles yeah. in religious institutions. So I went down the rabbit hole of just, you know, I'm not sort of trained at all. Uh, I'm a, a pseudo and an amateur by every measure of the word. I really am. But I was so sold on, you know, management. Yeah. And so much of the literature out there and the training out there is corporate. And I didn't realize until years later that it's actually at best in my head right now, 40% of the job, sure. the personality of a leader, sure. the relationship building acumen, For sure. the, the ability to forbear and absorb and win over and bring the best out of people and all of that yep. and sort of reset when things hit the fan and get past the bottleneck without, you know, amputating anything. And that is like 60% at least. Love it. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's so the, obviously the, the, the prophet said I'm emphasizing the concept of manners. Like we talk about manners, right? Um, and how the deen came to spread manners. And that's really a very, very important. But I think leaders don't realize they have another standard that they have to live up to. Like there's a, there's a, so there's the, like everybody has to have good manners, but then there's a leader, a leader's manners or their ethical mm. standards have to be much higher. So, and I think we see that throughout littered in our history, like from the Sira through the great leaders of the past, of course, the ones that, and we know in the books, like who are the ones that are great and who are the ones that are not, right? right? But the, the ability to connect and influence and people willing to follow you, by the way, for even without the ethics, those are leaders. Like you can have bad leaders, you know, right, right. bad ethics, bad morals, but they're Hitler they're able to move the masses, right? exactly. You're able, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hitler and so many others, right? right? Like, so there's no, there's actually no consideration of the ethics. If you can connect people and mobilize people, that's why it's good or bad. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, that's that's I think the pillar of leadership, hmm. right? Now again, we're talking about from a communal or a Muslim consideration. We'll definitely want to consider like with the ethics of Islam. Of course, okay. I think that. The second really important driver of community leadership, in my opinion, mm. is your ability to drive results and and get what we would say get wins. Like, what are the results that you are looking? Like, okay, is leadership just somebody that's socially cool, or they're able to get things done, make an impact, Cover make the ground. change? Yeah, take us drive, somewhere. Take lead. us exactly. Yeah. Lead us. What do we? What does it mean to lead us? Everybody thinks well. Well, they're going to tread the path, and we're going to follow them. But what, what's the where's the path going? Where, where are we where are we trying to do? So I think this so is where that's a, vision, right? Is that another? I way think, to say I think it? a lot of things fall under that. Or the ability efficacy. to create vision. Okay. I think the ability to create vision. I think the ability to create small wins out of a vision. Okay. What do you mean? Okay, we can have a vision. Love the get distracted, fluffy, by big picture stuff. That's great. What does that mean every day to us? 
Mm. How do we build for that every week, every month, every how do, what does that look like? You got to be able to not just give me the vision. You got to tread the path for me. You got to also tell me, hey, we're we're hitting the milestones that we want to. Like, are you like in a if you're in a community after a year, is there progress? How do you measure progress? Can't be after the fact. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, and maybe we'll get more, I'll get more kind of more practical because I think this ties to the massage today. But I think a lot of you, I've been in the, I've been in the role, boards, directors, um, imams, how do we measure their success? Mm. The only way is that the leaders or leader or leaders, they create the plan for success and they benchmark themselves against it. So I've got to, it's almost like, look, I always say community work is like being a CEO. You've got to know how to do everything. The hardest part is how do I create the path forward for my youth, my youth, uh, my youth department, my masjid. What, what are we, what do we want to do? What are the goals that we're trying to hit? And how do we make sure to deploy the right strategies and means to actually get them done? I'm hearing Qawiyun Amin right there. Right? Sure. The Quranic sure. Uh, leadership duet. You sure. Know, the best person to employ. She said to her dad, referring to Musa alayhi salam, is al-qawi, the competent. Yes. Al-ameen, yes. the person Trust. of integrity, trustworthy, yes. right? Yes. So integrity and efficacy or competence. Competence. And I remember Umar radiallahu anh also, uh, he would complain to Allah that he couldn't find someone to relieve him of his position. He yep. wished he could find, but in front of Allah he couldn't find. And of course, someone can lie to themselves and sort of be say this out of conceit, but he was saying this in the depths of... You know, in the whispers of his sujood, he would say, Oh Allah, I complain to you of the the weakness of the person of integrity and the durability of the person of mischief. Right? So, like, That's I funny. can't find the guy who's going to uh, have those two qualities. And we, of course, uh, complain to Allah <laughs> of ourselves to be more uh, competent and yes. have better integrity. I mean, I mean, I'm not projecting I mean, anything or throwing shade anywhere. Of course. But we all got to just keep each other accountable. Uh, and, I, you know, and I want to, so I want to say this because this will tie into some of the mayhem. Um, you can get tricked with one or the other in, in community leadership. Mm. In, in, from a board level, imam, um, imam level, across in the, in the masjid space, sometimes you have somebody who's really competent, not able to connect well. Mm. And some of you have people that are really are good connectors. They're great social ambassadors, but they're not competent. Mm. So you will eventually find that now you can fix both. Like we're not saying these are immovable traits. No, you, you, there's a, an, a, a personal investment. Let's talk about individual leaders that you have to put into that. Like I, I have to, I got to improve my planning skills. I, I can't get around that. I've got to be able to improve my, my ability to measure impact of, someone I'm teaching for for a year. Mm-hmm. Like I, I have to be able to be better at that and, and show competence, to your point, right? I think a lot of times... But we should be open to the fact that we sometimes need to also splice uh, our personal journeys from our community's journeys. Because sure. I need to sure. do better, yep. but what if there's someone who can do better now With while me. I'm working on yes. being better later yeah. in the long term? Yeah. Like, And sometimes it's even perpetual. Yani when the Prophet so said awesome. to... Uh, Abu Dhar, uh, yeah, Abu Dhar is a Muslim. Uh, and I see that you're weak. And Abu Dhar was anything but weak. The sure. weakness here was a weakness of discretion. Sure. He was too passionate yep. about sort of social justice. That's yes. what a Dhahabi said, actually. Sure. He said, I see that you're weak. You have a weakness, particular weakness, right? And I love for you what I love for me. Like, I'm, do yourself a favor because I don't want to see you hurt in front of Allah. Right? I, lo- I love for you what I love for me. So do not. Uh, don't accept to be a leader over any two people. Yep. And do not accept responsibility for the wealth of any orphans. Yes. Uh, and that we can sort of analyze that and unpack it later about sure. why those two particular things. But being able to tell yourself that, that, hey, wait, I need to do better. And so long as I'm stuck here, I'm going to try to do better. Right. Yep. Yep. But at the same time, if I can find someone, I'm not going to make the community wait for me right yeah, like yeah. If, if i can have someone right now that can lead the salah with better tajweed yes i should not hesitate in saying Be- beautifully you said. must lead not me yeah beautifully said i think so go back to your point i love that uh, the prophetic model on situational leadership is tremendous mm-hmm. prophet was able to really quickly understand 
I suppose. What situations leaders, like I have to put a leader in this position. And those are, they, they break some of the myths that we have of what we want leaders to be. And again, we've got to be, um, you know, kind of pivoting off the like personal leadership journey, like understanding how you fit into the community and community leaders understanding how people fit in very important. The Prophet Sallam, you know, how does Osama bin Zaid at a very young age, I mean, we're talking about 60, 17, 18 years old, whatever the, the age might, might have mm. been. How is he, how is he the general of an army going up against the Romans? Mm. Like what, what, with the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar in it, and Umar was loud and vocal against it. So why? It's inspirational in the abstract, but how do you actually not misuse that anecdote? Yeah, exactly. Mm. So how, why, so why was he there? Why was Khalid bin Walid, you know, radiallahu anhu, you know, he becomes Muslim after, you know, we're talking about, he he was essentially an enemy of the Prophet for nearly 20 years. Uh, Khalid, people don't know, came, became Muslim very end of his life. Right before Fatima came. Yeah, right, yep, last two years the of the, the Prophet life. Mm. So for 20 years, he had been an enemy of the Prophet He accepts Islam, radiallahu anhu. And immediately the Prophet, like within a few months, he's leading armies. And right. he never he dispatches him. He right. was never dispatched. Even yeah. though he had made some grave gravest mistakes. Grievous mistakes. Uh, uh, the, he had made some grave mistakes. The the reality is look, the Prophet understands there are situations where uh, people used to excel. And of course the, the famous one with Khalid relatively famous story that mm. he would have trouble reading kafirun Salah leading the army. Mm. But he had just you know, like what institution today, the thing about it like from our perspective, what institution would make an executive director of a masjid an eighteen year old kid? Or what institution would allow a convert after five months they didn't they don't they they barely maybe know how to pray, but they're on the board. We're not, and we're not saying do it. We're not we're saying, saying do it. Why categorically reject it? Exactly, exactly. Mm. It's like, hey, what, what did the Prophet understand? Mm. No, he understood. Look, competence in a situation, it actually it oversees certain what we would call disqualifiers. Like, he doesn't need need to, does somebody need to know how to remember, recite the Quran to help us organize the management, of the governance structure of our board. It's like it's, it's a different it's a different per- paradigm. Again, not to there's the there's the I think what I was trying to say the third state too, and I think it's really mm-hmm. important. I don't want to neglect it. So competence and connection, we're agreeing like these are really important, particularly what kind of leader you're trying to be. I think the last one, and we sometimes uh, under is probably there's this weird balance with this one. We are too loose on it or too strict on it, which is what I believe like the ethical aspects of being a leader, the state of the leader, the values of the leader, who the leader is within themselves. That is, first, that's a, that is accountable to Allah Azza first and foremost. So that's right. the, 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 amongst the first people that are punished by Allah Azza is, is a is a leader that transgresses because the insincerity was there, right? right. Um, uh, several examples: right. the imam and the, mm. the, the the scholar. That's you know just the 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 the, the, the nuance being, look, your your faith, your values, your ethics as a leader, that the internal, you know, what's kind of called in the corpus of the leadership psychology, mm. very popular kind of mm. uh, space now. Terminology now. Okay. Yeah, it's like, hey, this is what's happening within the leader. And How much of that actually is consequential? Yeah, uh, consequential to from what? So I'll give you just because I'm. This is new to me, uh, and I don't know how to process it even. Some organizations I know will require of you uh, to not purchase a house on an interest-bearing loan, for instance, sure. right? For their membership. For their members, wow. Right? That's, so yeah. uh, what are we measuring? Like what is yeah, consequential in your eyes versus yeah. what is sort of this is a personal issue or yeah. this is a, a juristically controversial issue? Yeah. What are we looking at? I, I think first and foremost, I think there's a lot of work that needs to happen to unpack that, okay. this concept. I, again, I'm Especially just like Especially from you, our paradigm I'm, a, I'm an amateur. Mm. I'm a student. I'm trying to learn. And I think... I think there's so much in the depth of the Islamic sciences and history and fiqh that still needs to be unpacked for our community. Because the reality is, 
reality is the Muslim community has never dealt with this with this paradigm of, of management that we're in. Right. Managing ourselves true. as institutions. Like that's not a paradigm that our parents know. Our grandparents don't know. There's no there's no muscle memory to how to manage a masjid or a community. Right, right. So it's the government and the non profit as we call it today, non profit. Exactly. There was a merger. Exactly. And it was a sort of a healthy cycle. Exactly. Al -Qaf, the endowments were exactly. funding enabling yep. us That's and true. and to, and to to be able to manage without government intervention institutions yeah that's a it's a tough reality it's again there's no muslim there's no backbone there's no Precedent. nothing we can lean on so mm -hmm. hence there's a lot of paving the way i think from the islamic sciences but also the management sciences but let's go back to your point because i loved it let's talk about let's just talk about the the most standard position of leadership is the imam. I'm, I've never been an imam. You're you're the default at least in this conversation uh, expert on imam imamship. What are the ethical standards that we can we have to judge an imam by? I don't think there's a there's no book or manual for that, right? It's right now I'm calling for one actually. You, it, there, again, it's in an, my WhatsApp groups yeah, where I exactly. try to Exactly. Because because you have like okay, we have let's just say 5,000 messages across the country. <laughs> The first, the first and foremost leader of each of those places, or like the natural, who we're going to hire as a community, we need to bring an imam. So you have 5,000 open jobs for imam. And these are, I mean, I don't want to belittle, the role of imam is tremendous. It's, it's the community builder. It's the, it's not, it's not, we, and you know, like, it's not just you come and you lead salah and you read and you leave. It's, no, no, I'm here to build this community. I'm the, the to inform pin, their lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah, the face of the community. We have no manuals. We have going back to the mayhem, like like well, what's the book? So on you that? consider that I actually wanted to ask you a whole lot of questions <laughs> about root causes. But let's start with religious leadership. Would you consider that one of at least the greatest root causes yeah. for uh turbulence, mayhem yeah. uh, on the religious leadership level? There's no standard I, I, I think exactly. that can be identified? Yeah, great question. I think I think principally there's three root causes. Okay. One of them is the leadership. Mm. Now, let's start with leadership. I think, first and foremost, love the quote of John Maxwell, everything rises and falls on leadership. Mm. Right. So if we fix leadership, we will fix a lot of the, the, the challenges that we're having. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I need a community that elects people that know how to lead and manage an institution. So there has to be this em embracement of not just, look, we're, I think in the nonprofits, you generally get people that are the financiers of the institutions. Patrons. Or, yep, or they're the servants, or like they're the most dedicated volunteer, and which is great. But then you have to be able to mix in some level of expertise of leadership management into that. Like who understands how to how do we operationalize this? Now you can get that from outside. I'm fine with that. Or maybe we need to create more of those. But like the lead, that leadership culture is really important. Before I choose who is eventually that community is going to choose, like who's the leader that we want to bring in? Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? Like what kind of community do we want? What are, what are our what are our what do we believe is the most important thing in the community that we're in? Like, what's most important? What are the primary objectives? What are the, what are the primary objectives? Like, yeah. is it, um, and I know it's probably because communities go from a little musalla to this massive building. It's hard to project that far. It's probably, you know, the growth community. But it's like, hey, like, at this current state for the foreseeable future, like, hey, we got, if we have 300 families around, we need somebody that can connect to families. If we have a blue-collar, in-and-out community, Transit. Uh, transient, right, if it's a college town, like you've got to understand your realities pretty well to be able to decide that, right? I can't just plop somebody in and like, I, for lack of a better term, like I'm just going to import somebody, mm. whether from overseas or from somewhere else, and they're just going to fit in here. Like you, I've got to figure out like what kind of community we want. What are we trying to do? Mm. Um, what's the size? What's the, what's the, what's the ethical considerations? What's the, I mean, I'm, it, it, it might be tough to say, but diverse communities – I want a kind of a diverse religious leadership, um, whereas a lot within of times boundaries. We, yeah, I know you mean that, but it, I want to make sure the within, audience does as well. Within boundaries, of course, within boundaries. But like, I think let's talk about a few realities. Like the suburb realities are very diverse 
in nature. And I think the, the, like, do we lean on one ethnicity so the other one is sidelined? Or if there's like two or three major, how, how do you choose an imam based on the ethnicity? Do we just go with someone that's not there? Or, you know, like there's, there's all these considerations that happen. And I think that simply those are, again, new realities, new challenges. I don't know how to answer those. But, but you, it, you know, if I may, that was one of the, uh, I, it's just easier for me to, to point out where I've been wrong. Sure. <laughs> than the places where I feel like, sure. alhamdulillah, we've made some strides. But in this community, one thing that I was very keen on and uh, to notice, and I did, was that when we hired uh, a staff member that was African-American, Sheikh Ibrahim Jaber, mm. and he started getting into the rotation of the khutbah, and he's a very competent khatib. This was not tokenizing or anything. Uh, it was very obvious, and I wasn't expecting it. It just, you couldn't uh, not notice it. It was impossible. African Americans started showing up in greater numbers in our Jumu'ah. Yeah. And for me, I was like, wow, we're sitting here harping on, you know, the fact that we need someone who speaks good English. And here I am, American born Khatib, so I speak good English. But no, it was representation that mattered to them. Exactly. Not just sort of the the language right. dimension. So it was humbling for me to realize that. Look. I think you think you got it figured out, but there are elements here you got to sit there and say, you know, am I just confirming my biases? Am I really open to realizing what my community needs right now? Yeah. Like, for example, a diversity in leadership to feel validated and represented. Yeah. I beautifully said, I think, when I was very young in, in the manage, masjid management space, I remember like the youth center, we were uh, very intentional as a team. You know, there's your preset khatibs, they're there. You know, we've defined them. Uh, I, I, again, speaking to this reality, like we did surveys of our Jumas. Like mm. we actually audited our Jumas for several months, wow. asking the, the congregants what they're looking for, topics that they're looking for, their demographics. Or, like we did so an analysis. So it's not just anecdotal. Of, yeah. Right. And then when, when you realize, okay, look, and we made a hard shift. And I remember uh, Muhammad Mathir and I were like, we were trying to spearhead. We were shifting from an Arabic uh, uh a long time Arabic khutbah to shift it completely English. Like that, in the inner city, maybe, uh, you know, suburbs, they, they hear like Fine this. Fine, incoherent. Like, yeah, like, but in the inner city, there's... It's uh, not a no-brainer. It's not it's a no-brainer. It's all, brainer. yeah, exactly. You're, You're right. Till today, there's communities 40 years old, it's only one language, right? Correct. And, and, and the reality is, you again, the disenfranchisement of a younger generation um, because of just persisting in that. But anyway, we were, we were very insisting, like, hey, we're going to bring... We have our presets, but you're going to bring different ethnicities, different caliber of leader uh, of khatibs, uh, scholars, different ages, different ages, ethnicities, different exactly. calibers, different communities. Mm. Like you, it's a great actually, actually is a phenomenal um, community networking opportunity. That I'm sure you do that here. I know and, and other places. Like you bring imams from different areas to give, you know. The ability to connect with different communities. I, I, I absolutely love that. But again, so root causes, you're saying, if I'm not uh, going to be interrupting a major thought here, is not identifying the objective enough. And based on that, uh, we're going to just be random, really, arbitrary, e exactly. not realizing it. Exactly. Yeah. Understanding really well exactly your community, I think, are making um, thorough, thoughtful decisions. Let's just say, like, the thoughtful decisions mm. that are required is really, really important to resolving the mayhem. Understanding your congregants, understanding your community, your reality. I think that's really important. Um, so there is something that I'm sure is on different people's minds. It's definitely on mine as well, which is not just the age groups, the ethnicities uh, of the community, the location, the demographic, but the size that you refer yeah. to and the phase, right? Yeah. I'll never forget, and I'm, I was very grateful, Islamic Relief, they had once sponsored a nonprofit summit where they brought in experts uh, in management, in fund development, and in legalities sure. uh, and legal uh, counsel that were responsible, a lot of them, for the building and evolution and stabilization of some of the megachurches in the South even. So, the, I mean, they got a lot under their belt, yeah. uh, a lot of credit, street cred. And so one of the things that they did with us, all Muslim leaders, you know, nascent Muslim communities trying to like figure out our way is that they explained to us what uh, governance models are 
Yeah. Right. So they said this is called the advisory board model. This yeah. is called the team management model. Yes. This one is called the cooperative model. Yes. This one is called the patron model. Yeah. And they explained to us what each of that is. That's where the board is everything. Yeah. And this is where they hire someone and they offload almost everything. Yes. And this is where it's an honorary seat and they use them to sort of finance and network to other financers to sort of sustain the play. Yeah. And then after they told us all of this, they said they made us vote on what's the best model. Mm. And we're all voting and, you know, so sure of ourselves. And, like, after all this, the guy smiles. And it was a trick question. Yeah, sure. He says the biggest problem in infrastructure in the nonprofit world yep. is when you don't recognize when you need which of these. Exactly. If Wonderful. you ever get stuck in that fixed mindset, yep. if you ever sign out of the growth mindset. Because some, you know, we spoke about in the previous episode – Many communities who are saying, no, 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 no. We're not at the stage yet where we can afford to hire an imam. Yep. And I'm always arguing that you need to hire an imam so you can grow. Sure. Some communities will move past that. that they've hired one or two or three people and then get very sort of skeptical or uneasy about moving a bit further. Like, yeah. should I continue building and they will come or are they done coming? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I started seeing it unfold in front of me and I said, wow, this is a very delicate conversation. Yes. But at the very least, at the fundamental model, like being practical, I'm sure you've seen tons of success and yep. horror stories, Akhi, yep. more than me. What do you advise like the small masjid, the medium masjid, the big masjid? Yeah, yeah uh, great question. So um, great set of questions. I'll start with... Um, yeah, I unloaded. I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'll start with... Uh, uh, the, the what I the main takeaway from sort of beautiful story is like look your realities change you've got to be adjustable with uh, you need an un, un, unimaginable amount of uh, flexibility and agility in nonprofit work you've got to be able to understand like the phases that you go through so let's start with the the smallest phase like you're the startup masjid or the small masjid or well, for whatever reason maybe you've been around for a long time and you're just that small masjid I think generally at that level you're right your 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 board is going to take needs to play a bigger role in supporting the infrastructure and the build of the masjid. We would say, and I think, we, again, we have a number of workshops that kind of dive into each of these phases. But like, let's say, number one, you want to be able to define your roadmap for the next few years, right? So you have to have clarity on like, hey, we got to get together. We're going to, we just got elected. We're a new board. What do we want to, again, go back to? What's the metric of success that we want to do? What are we trying to do? All right, we want to increase our funds by X. We want to uh, we want to hire an imam. Maybe we need an imam and another two imams or whatever it might be. We need to increase the capacity of our Quran school, our Sunday school. Like you've got to be able to sit down and define really quickly. You you can't keep operating the same way. You've got to be defined a path forward. That's, I think, the first Kicking thing. Kicking the ball down the road, moving uh, the goalposts. Exactly. Is a killer, for sure. Uh, second thing is like, look, hey, we, we're going to... Uh, we're going to manage the masjid more closely and as a smaller institution. Like the board has to play a bigger role and it's got to really be good at elevating volunteers around it. Like you've got to be able to lean on volunteers, usually a small subset of volunteers, and you've got to be able to lean on them. They complement your imam, hopefully, and some of the other activities that you're doing, but you're going to lean on volunteers to build programming. Again, I think we're we're trying to build uh, at Oak Tree, we're trying to do this model of like, what does this growth look like? At each level, what are you supposed to be doing? But there's like, you know, the knowledge track. It's like, hey, we want a, one family night. Okay, we have a khutbah, of course. Like, maybe we add a, a family night to the add to the knowledge track. Mm. Maybe our our programs track across audiences. Hey, maybe we add one youth program. We had one pre tease program. We had one kids program. Like, you've got to have, again, build those metrics. So as a, as a smaller institution, you're going to take on bigger roles. I think the... Complexity is, okay, now what about a medium institution? What are they supposed to do? Yeah, they have to start, uh, this is the hard part, get empowering people. And by empowering, we mean either hiring or start more and more defaulting to, like, hey, we're going to bring in an imam and a religious director. And we're going to bring in a youth director. We're going to bring in a facility manager. We're going to, like, you're at that, that size where you as a board cannot... You can maybe manage a few functions of like programs. Hopefully, still the strategy is still there, but you, you're going to be start to offload more and more. And then I think at the from a capacity perspective, I think at the highest level, the biggest what we call mega messages or the biggest institutions, they're in the crisis right now of the the reality of there's two big tracks of leadership they need to think about. They need one, to get harmonized. Yeah. 
one is the religious leadership track. Mm. So we need a team of religious leaders, not one person. Right. But we need a, a resident scholar, an imam, subs- you know, assistant imams. You know, you need a religious leadership team. Right. And then some people are really successful at this one. But then you need an executive or operations leadership team. Hmm. You need an executive director. The imam can't be going to the media for PR and doing the interfaith banquet and going to each donors. Uh, like, the, like you can't only lean on your religious leadership. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of executive things, programs, services, activities, facilities. They need dedicated staff. They need dedicated staff. So independent de- exactly. staff. Exactly. So sure. really the compliment is acro- trying to run across both tracks. That's more hard. It's difficult. I think, again, we can help pave the way, way forward. But you need uh, a pronged approach for, for your leadership capacity. So... Let's say someone recognizes this. They have the growth mindset. Uh, they're decent at identifying what phase they're in. Uh, where do you find these good intentions and plans in principle sure. on their way? Do they run into unforeseen obstacles, major obstacles towards this? It, uh, tell me, define, what, what do you mean by major obstacles? So, is it, so identifying is it resources? the right leadership is one example that may come to my so, head if you were to ask me that yeah, question. Yeah, so, identif- right? so identifying right leadership. Like this- there are communities that wait on a religious leader for yeah. five, ten years. Yes, and yes, yes. perhaps they could have built one by then. Sh- uh, sure, yes. Yeah, so great, great point. So I, I can go in many ways. I don't know. How you, Take uh, your time. Uh, we have about basically... 15 minutes or so on the hour, okay. right? So uh, 15 hour, and we only have one or two questions okay. left. And I want to be, I want to be mindful. We're going to do the superstar thing. Exactly. Right? So yeah. you don't have to give too much here. Okay. And we'll so, always overlap between uh, episodes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so let's go with, uh, let's go with, um, let's go with the obstacles. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we overcome obstacles? So, well, number one, what is the obstacle? If it's a resource thing. You've got to you've got to really attack that. If we're talking financial resources, yep, you got to get creative as a masjid. Um, I think we're trying to help in that space too. Like, hey, if we're a masjid and we our community's not able to sustain us, so how can if I'm going to bring somebody on, I need a year's worth of that funding ready before we bring that person on. Ideally, I've, here I'll tell you about this horror stories, but like, hey, we're we've thought like we need an X amount of fund to bring somebody in, we're going to just work on that fund for a year or two. But once we once we trigger that fund, it doesn't go to like, a, well, let's just expand the building. No, no, we've committed to... To the empire. <laughs> yeah, let's just renovate the bathroom. No, no, no. Let's, right, right, right. let's just... Let, let's, let's, if we want to invest in people, we've got to be, be thoughtful and, and planning about it and right. allocate the resources to it. Again, being more creative. So, so if a it's a financial obstacle. obstacle. Got it. Right? So dedicate the time and resources to it. Now, let me speak about this. Too many big and small institutions do the travesty of bringing somebody on. They can't even pay their paycheck more past three months. I mean, I know people personally that have worked for institutions and been back paid for four or five months in a row. That's absolutely unacceptable. Like it's, no doubt about it. There's, there's no way. The salary itself the, is above average. Let, let alone the salary. But then you're like, oh, not we just even. needed somebody. We'll, we'll back pay them. That's absolutely unacceptable. It should be, again, the thoughtfulness. It's like the planning, the strategy, the thoughtfulness of like, yeah, we want to bring on a new person. Okay, do we have their, do we have what we need for this person for six months a year to sustain them and their family? Like that's just, just that mere fact of doing that, it goes a long way. Right. It takes us two years, three years. Okay. okay. I mean, that's okay. So financial obstacles. Let's, let's go to the second obstacle. Like, hey, look, we're, we have external forces that are, that are, are hindering us. Like the community, or we're in the, a small town. Or yeah, a small region. town, exactly. Like there's external for it. We have a uh, yeah. So there's if there's external forces again. I think small and steady. Like it's okay to build to your point. I like that. Yeah, maybe we need five years, ten years to find the right person. That's okay. That's okay. Or to 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 be where we want to be. I think the last one is the most difficult. I know you want me to get to that. Is what if the People dynamics in the institution are just chaotic. We have all the resources. Before you get to that, let me just add that I, I've seen some very nice success stories of at least religious leadership, because that's my neck of the woods in these uh, projects, 
where they say, you know, we do have a call to hire. It's been sitting there forever. Yeah. But we have actually sponsored a student to go to Dar al Uloom, go to Medina. Love that. They've graduated Mishka. Love it. I know people who say, I remember this imam when he was a little kid Love in our it. community. Look at him now, man. Yeah. He's our pride and glory. And subhanAllah, you know, just d- 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 like be ready to adapt, have a plan B. 100%. Don't wait. We're already playing catch up. 100%. I think creativity, you hit it on the head. Or, or organic is really important. You can always import, but organic, I, I believe in the Look organic at Qalam. model. Yeah. Qalam Seminary. Exactly. Yep. I'm being surprised, to be honest. Mashallah. Shout out to Qalam. Yes. Because I don't, I was not very close to Qalam. I know essentially who they are and what they do. And sure. I'm very happy and proud of them. I'm hearing about growth. But now on the receiving end, I'm traveling to Masajid. And it was sort of like a, a three in three months type thing where I'm a Qalam graduate. Yeah. The imam that Mashallah. I meet at a local masjid. Yeah. And that's just so inspirational yeah. for me. And I, and Alhamdulillah, I did that's I did, vision. I did a year of Qalam. Uh, Sheikh Abn is an outstanding leader. I think he's Allah very Allah thoughtful is. about what he's trying to do in like this community engine. We absolutely need an engine of um, of someone that's pumping out religious leadership. Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 a it's got to be nonstop. Mm-hmm. And and no disrespect to anyone else. Of either, course, of course. I just I noticed course. it. Like yeah. wow, no, there's, I'm there's so happy absolutely. to hear that. And, and there's honestly other institutions too that they don't get into that community. The community taking on community leadership is tough, and and you know that. So I love I love the piece. Um, if you, I think another mistake so another is another major obstacle. No, I, I think another me. mistake is just on that point. Mm. I think sometimes communities have a leader, and they don't trust that leader to build leaders around them enough. They don't like, hey, we don't want you uh, from the religious perspective. Mm. Uh, we love that you're teaching fifteen classes, but we'd like to give you three young people t- that you can develop for us. Mm. Like, hey, tell me. You think it's a trust issue? I personally don't. I think it's a multifaceted issue. Know I think, where that comes I think from. Some, yeah. to be honest, sometimes the leaders themselves don't want the competition. Mm. I think I think sometimes the leaders themselves either they keep themselves too busy to build the next leader, mm. the succession plan. Really? Subhanallah. I, I well, that's a value so. issue for sure. That's I, a sure tragedy. I think I I think that, I think that that it's tough, and then we're gonna get. Into I mean, I believe so, it. They're, 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 yeah, we're, we're human. Yes, there's keep the human. Going. There's a human side of it. But I think, like, we don't, we should be, the takeaway should be invest more time and more folks around you. I love the, uh, Muhammad Abbas, he's a great mentor of mine in the space. He, he used to tell us, like, when you're a leader, you find your replacement day one in nonprofit. Like, who's going to replace you? Are you, do you have that person? Is it clear to you? Because mm-hmm. everybody's going to, it's, everybody's saying hello and goodbye. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Like, so, yeah, exactly. So make sure that you're day one prepping that person. I love that the, 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 the concept. Mindset. Just the, yeah, yeah, the mindset. Sure. So our religious yeah. leaders need that. But then, yes, you're right. Our institutions are not patient enough. Like, oh, we're going to send somebody to Qalam. Well, we got to wait six years. Like, are we willing to are we willing to be patient when you can just kind of like do it quickly? So that there's the there's the the balancing act of mm. it for sure. What other obstacles now? Yeah, the the people dynamics. So the, the, the obstacle of like, hey. We elect 12 people, 15 people, 70. I don't know how many of these boards get crazy. Like all these, you know, it's a revolving door two years, four years. And we can never get the, the continuity and the synergy hmm. of a leadership team. Because the reset button is always getting There's hit. There's always, re- yeah, exactly. Hmm. So so that is, a, the governance structure is another very big challenge. It's chaos because everybody does their own thing or hmm. replicates what next door is doing, essentially. So You know, a mentor of mine, and I, I'm not, Republican or Democrat, but he said to me something very profound. He said, America is a great country because it was able to withstand Trump. Sure. Like everyone, if you remember before Trump got sure. into office, at least his detractors were going bonkers. Sure. You know, he's going to do this and he's threatening to do that and he's saying, this. and then the conspiracy videos were actually getting a little bit more co- colorful in the, yeah. in the prophecies they were uh, prophesying. And then my mentor said to me, Muhammad, like, America is not a masjid. <laughs> America has the infrastructure and the checks and balances yep. to withstand even someone as yep. eccentric as Trump. Yeah. And look, he came and he left. And yes, of course, there is a, there's a decline in every of empire. Sure. But America is still America. Sure. 
Sure. And I was blown away by that. Yeah, the governmental apparatus didn't fall apart because someone came out of left field to take and started slapping his own allies. Exactly. Basically. Yeah, it's a great. It, I, I think in a lot of trains. So, we talk a lot to boards. I was like, hey, if you guys all left and didn't come back, how much would be left here? Like, what's the what's the ethar? What's your what's your effect after you're gone? Mm. And that is that is a lot of. Up, yeah, you got to operationalize things. You you have to have a robust way, and this is tough too, because even us as leaders on the ground don't do that. We don't we don't even we don't even write our own like we don't even have contracts, and we work just v- verbal agreements on the most important people that are hired by the institution. It's just all mm-hmm. verbal, or like yeah, hey, how often? Uh, I think and I I think I think the lack of institutionalizing the institution is one of the key causes of the mayhem. Hmm. Nobody wants to spend time doing it. And what about, I want your take on this, even though it's a can of worms, the concept of, uh, so that's a little bit of like the, the free-for-all concept. Sure. There's another shade of this, which is what some may call the like over-democratization of sure. it. Where you hit these stagnation the points because there's just too much. Yeah. So so much so much stagnation that one party will sue the other. Or will break off, right? Like, you can or get, too many opinions, or, not enough or, sort of like decisive, too timely many opinions. decision yes, making. Hundred right. percent. And look, I think I've been there. I've been there. I've been in the board meetings where one person wants to talk about, you know, the balloon parade, and one person wants to talk about the. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope these aren't true stories. One person. Or else wants we're going to have to about, cut this video. Hey, let's do a parade. And one person wants to talk about. Hey, let's. Uh, you know, the landscapers and the ones who started talking about, hey, why don't we invite, you know, Sheikh XYZ to our next youth conference that's, you know, some international star. You know, it's like, it's all over, right? There's, there's absolutely, because there isn't a, subhanAllah, the checks and balances in institutions actually, there should be, there's no, what does seniority mean in a masjid? Like, how do I get to the level of being at the top of, like, making really critical decisions? What's that, what's that journey like? It, well, it's, if I'm a rich doctor that gives the most money, I'm just going to be on that board. Or right, if, right. I'm a, if I'm a, a dedicated mom that serves, the, I'm going to, mm-hmm. like, how do, if I'm an I'm a aspiring, good-speaking 20-year-old guy that gives khutbahs mm-hmm. that are motivating, I'm going to be on the board. Like, what is, what is the, what is the, how do you how do you measure the progress, right? Like, no, it's profound. Typically, by it, the way, I need to say because I laughed so hard at the balloon thing. Within religious leadership as yeah. well, we hear of very of difficult, of course, uh, sort of tensions that are because of how wide the spectrum can be of on course. what is going to fix the experience, the ummah, yeah, or the local ummah, and so the priority 100%. debate. Uh, can't be open ended. We have to get past decision paralysis, so we need some way to move this forward. Exactly. So I'm not sort of and like look, dogging on any yeah, sector that's look, not my own. And here's the the conundrum, and I think this is important for board members to hear this. A lot of times, uh, board members might be be sitting in the highest level of the, um, they're the safeguards, they're the custodians of the institution, but they're not the most important people in the institution. It's probably the, if it's a strong imam, it's probably the imam. If it's a strong leader, community, it's probably the leader. And so you've got to hopefully lean into them supporting you and helping you tread the path of priority. Again, it goes back to competence. Like, if I'm a, if I'm a good imam, uh, a good meaning, like, I'm able to, like, steward my board. Like, I've got to be able to lead up. Yep. Hey, hey, I'll, like, hey, let's, let's create a path forward. Let's be key on, like, what are the strategic objectives? Like, just these simple terminologies are very important, or else we're always stuck in uh, Palestine today and Bangladesh tomorrow, and oh, you know, somebody poor. Let's create a food pantry. Let's create a. Let's do like it. it we're gonna react when to you're these going in every direction, perpetual. you're not going anywhere. I think yeah. The the, the point I think for leaders this is important to know. Uh, the saying is. Effort does not mean effectiveness. Just because you're doing a lot doesn't mean you're doing a lot. Mm. Uh, so you've got to be able to understand clearly, like, yeah, sure, there will be moments where we can steer off. But look, we're, and I've, I've been, for I give, a, give a specific example. Uh, I joined, when I moved to Dallas, the, I was a youth director the first few years there. 
And it was hard for me to leave, you know, a Brooklyn kid leaving for the first time. It's, t- it's tough to leave family and mm. nuances. If I didn't see unimaginable synergy with the leadership, like, hey, we believe in youth. We believe, like, th- we're not, we are built that like a MSJ, yeah. but we're all about the youth. And I said very clearly, hey, look, um, love it. Everything is about the youth. That means, okay, we're going to build a youth team. We're going to build youth work. Like, everything is going to be synergized around these young people, right? And that, that's, it's tough because when you break the door, or there's a hole in the wall from the soccer ball, or like the, you, you know, like, hey, are we really, like, are we going to shut everything down, or do we really believe? No, that's our priority. That's part of the No cost. matter what. Yeah. You have to have that commitment on, like, it's clear to us. The focus is youth. That means everything that comes with that is going to just happen. Same with community, we're families. Embraced. Yeah, like, hey, we have, we're, we're serving families. Okay, that means, that means your space has got to be accommodating to moms with, with babies. Everybody fine? Everybody fine with a baby crying during our show or no? Everybody ready for that? Or, or like, what are we trying to do? I think leadership has got to set the tone, and we've got to kind of mobilize around, to your point, What's the values and what's the priorities? And I I think there's no way around that. I'm actually uh, happy that I don't have time to ask you the last question. Sure. uh, On my mind, which is how do we overcome these obstacles uh, in scale, right? And I think a better question to be asked, if you want to sort of speak to it in a minute's time, fine. But I think it's a perfect reason to tell people really what Oak Tree can offer them. Sure. Because there's probably going to need a customization about overcoming some of these obstacles. Sure. With the particularities of their projects, their institutions. Sure. Um, so I'm talking about Oakshi kind of at, a, at, a, at a, its foundation because it, a lot of people um, don't know. So Oakshi is a nonprofit that's been around for over 10 years. Sure. Yeah. I think it started off, the vision of the initial founding board was, uh, you know, education around leadership. Mm. And then that really evolved throughout ver- various phases. And until today, I think we, we really are, our focus is to support Muslim leaders within the nonprofit spaces. And I think that's a very, alhamdulillah, myself and our team, like we've, always, we've been on the ground, like we've been the frontline leaders in community work for a long time. And then we became kind of experts in different aspects of that leadership. And so what, I'm, what we're trying to do is really bring a tailored, customized solution to our community ag- across these difficult problems. Like, what does a strategic plan mean for a masjid? How do you create a strategic plan? Like, what is the path forward? And what are all the stakeholders a part of that? And how do we actually synergize and align around it? We actually help orgs through that. Um, hey, how do we actually structure programs and activities? How do we scale that in a masjid? What are the different programs and activities we should be having? We help kind of train and we, I would say we kind of consult because we do a lot of you know, discovery work with, with, with mm. masjid and understanding what their budgets are and their volunteers and their leaders and their history but i think we help tread the path forward for them we forgive very, very me how does that differ from consulting in my little head no I no it is, it is we would say it's a consult it is consulting okay. work but we're we we're not a do it for you like a lot of times hey can oh. you guys come and speak to our imam and performance manage him can you guys come and help us write our bylaw like we're not we're not at the level we don't have the capacity to to do it we really are just trying to train on best practices and the experiences that we that we were bringing from various other communities and ourselves. Awesome, man. Uh, so, and that's, I think, look, um, let's be honest, too. People don't want to learn. Like, I think we, I've personally been in this space for about five years, this kind of training and development for the Muslim community. It's a, it's a hard sell. People, we're not, maybe because of the reactionary nature of our organization, we're just so head down, focus on the next thing. Hmm. But, um, Trying to train your volunteers, your staff. I mean, we 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 we've done some of the things. We do staff-wide training on like customer service. Like, how does everybody, from the imam to the janitor and all the volunteers, how do they think about serving their customers in a masjid setting? Make right? it a pleasant experience. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Mm. Exactly. And and training on some of those things. And and a lot of times it's them figuring it out, them giving us scenarios that they've gone through, and we pop it up and we tell them, hey, okay, how do you guys tackle this? You know, mom spilled, yelled at this, the middle of Ramadan, tarawih is going on. You know, we know the chaos. Like, hey, how are we coming together to solve this problem? And that's, that's the, the, the stuff that I think our institution is just not investing enough in the willingness to learn the best practices and to try to elevate their standards. No, that's fantastic. May Allah guys reward you guys in ways that, uh, that will continue to live on in Amen. the communities and in Amen. your offspring, inshallah, azawajal, Allahumma ameen. And uh, I know, putting this podcast together, that this is not meant for scale. This is a very niche subject. Yeah. 
Uh, and so I do want uh, anyone who's listening and interested to uh, to connect with the likes of Oak Tree and benefit yourselves and invest in it. And, you know, let's professionalize. Let's be people of uh, Ihsanic Islamic work, right? Awesome. With excellence, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, the spirit of our deen. And may Allah help us. May Allah help mm-hmm. us pass the baton the day mm-hmm. that we pass it with our mm-hmm. heads up high in front of Allah Azza wa Jal for mm-hmm. the little bit that we did in our little corners of the world. Just like mm-hmm. Khair, Brother Rami, mm-hmm. I look forward to having you again on some future subjects, inshallah ta'ala. My and to all our viewers, please do share this and leave your comments so that we can we know what needs to be addressed and we're not speaking in a silo. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.